and welcome to Aviation Deep Dive. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at the flagship of Germany's often forgotten heavy bomber fleet. The Luftwaffe's bomber force, often remembered solely in terms of medium bombers, such as the Heinkel HE-111, was admittedly far too slow and hesitant to accept the importance of heavy bombers and strategic bombing of enemy industry. But what not many people realize is that they didn't shun this class of aircraft entirely. A four-engined bomber driving two enormous four-meter propellers, weighing 32 tons and being longer than a Lancaster, the Heinkel HE-177 Greif was a bizarre aircraft, born of a mishmash of conflicting requirements, strange design ideas, and technological limitations. Nevertheless, over 1,000 of these giants would be produced, but to better understand the fascinating and at times frustrating story of this aircraft, we must first harken back to 1936. I want to take a moment to thank the sponsors of today's video, World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play action game on PC and console based around naval warfare, and I'm glad they reached out to sponsor today's video, as it's genuinely a very cool game. It's got over 600 unique ships and over 40 unique maps, along with a dynamic weather system and pretty beautiful graphics to boot. World of Warships also receives monthly updates which consistently add new material, whether it be new nations, cosmetics, ship classes, or even unique additions such as the Godzilla vs King Kong, Megadeth, and Popeye updates. So why not try your hand at commanding some of the most iconic submarines, battleships, even aircraft carriers that the world's ever seen? World of Warships also has a thriving community of dedicated maritime enthusiasts, so there's no shortage of action to take part in. Download World of Warships today, with the link in the description, and when you're registering, use the code on screen now to get a huge holiday starter pack. Again, it's free and a great bundle, so check the first link in the description and pinned comment, and use the code Happy New Year 2024 to get all these excellent perks. And a huge thanks once again to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. At this time, the idea of strategic bombing, courtesy of some strong proponents of it in the Luftwaffe, was still considered worth exploring, although this would change fairly quickly in the coming years. Alongside some other projects intended to bear the fruit of a new generation of Luftwaffe bombers, the RLM issued Bomber A, a specification that called for a pure strategic bomber capable of carrying a bomb load of 1,000 kilograms over a range of 5,000 kilometers, not dissimilar to the requirements of the Dornier DO-19, which we've also covered on this channel. The aircraft was also, unusually, directed to have only two engines. It was believed that this would lower drag and allow the aircraft to be faster, and the Luftwaffe really liked the ideas of fast bombers. Issued on the 3rd of June 1936, in a stroke of very unfortunate luck, the biggest proponent of German strategic bombing, General Walter Viva, was killed in an air crash on the very same day. In a single blow, the future of any aircraft to come from the specification looked significantly less promising than it had the day before. But nevertheless, Heinkel opted to take it on and start development. Straight off the bat, there were a few design considerations that made work on a bomber to the specification difficult. First, the RLM wanted it to reach at least 500 km an hour, 310 miles an hour, at its service altitude, a speed that was not only faster than all contemporary bombers, but of virtually all contemporary fighters. Not only this, but a strict two-engine limitation had been imposed on the project, meaning that the engines would have to be enormously powerful to propel a heavy bomber faster than anything else in the sky. It was decided that the aircraft needed a pair of engines that produced at least 2,000 horsepower to meet the design requirement. There was just one small issue. There was no power plant available in Germany at that time that could meet that power output. The reason the RLM was dead set on a twin-engine design was because of drag. It was believed that with a traditional four-engine design and all of the drag associated with it, 
A large amount of the power produced by the extra engines is countered by the extra drag caused by the extra engine nacelles and propellers. Having just two engines with contra-rotating propellers allows for less drag with a theoretically similar power output whilst also negating torque. As such, to achieve the needed power levels as well as the design requirements, it was decided by Heinkel to mate together two DB601s driving a single crankshaft to produce what would be dubbed the DB606, a 24-cylinder 2500 horsepower engine that weighed some 1.5 tons. The DB606 would be one of only two German engines throughout the entire war to break the 2000 horsepower threshold. At this point, with a significant amount of the design finished, the RLM stepped in. Having watched their Stukas show their excellent combat effectiveness in the Spanish Civil War, they had a reinvigorated enthusiasm for dive bombing. Now, of course, they wouldn't be so stupid as to try and turn a strategic bomber into a dive bomber, except, well, yeah, that's actually exactly what they did. It's unclear exactly what about the 32-ton, 70-foot-long bomber on the drawing board screamed future dive bomber to the RLM, but inexplicably it did. Heinkel was ordered to introduce various design changes, such as strengthened wings, to make the aircraft, now dubbed the HE-177, capable of undertaking 30-degree dive bombing. The RLM had begun to look on the aircraft not as a strategic bomber, but is essentially a long-range Stuka, a role its design was completely at odds with. Still, regardless of Heinkel's concerns, a mock-up was constructed of the aircraft in November 1937, which was showcased to the Luftwaffe High Command on the 5th of that month. The significant strengthening of the structure to make the aircraft capable of undertaking dive bombing had increased the weight significantly, so what comes next perhaps resembles a comedy sketch more than real life. Luftwaffe Colonel Ernst Udet, upon being showcased the mock-up of the aircraft, mentioned to Heinkel that the requirements had been changed once again. Now, the HE-177, larger and heavier than a B-17, should be capable of undertaking dive bombing attacks at angles of up to 60 degrees. So once again, the wing and fuselage sections were strengthened, to the point where the aircraft was so heavy that its original undercarriage could no longer support it. And despite all of this work, the airframe was still considered susceptible to overstress during dive bombing attacks. To rub salt in the wound, a big part of the reason that the Luftwaffe was more interested in dive bombing was the fact that throughout the 1930s, their bomb sites had been broadly inferior and less accurate than similar types fielded in the UK or US. However, promising development of the Luftwaffe 7 bomb site, which was broadly on par with the American Norden bomb site, negated this issue and ultimately Hermann Goering would remove all of the dive bombing requirements placed on the HE-177, by which time the aircraft was already in full scale production, and the rolling back of all the reinforcements and extra weight would mean retooling a significant part of the wing production line. Heinkel would eventually opt not to. Further development of the aircraft was slow, the constant insane design requirements had had negative effects on numerous facets of the aircraft, which were constantly redesigned. And this was on an aircraft that was already fairly technically difficult to work on anyway, owing to the numerous technological innovations it introduced. Aside from its unique engine layout, Heinkel also intended to make use of evaporative cooling elements in the wings to further reduce drag as well as to deck out the aircraft with remote control defensive turrets, a technology which promised higher accuracy as well as the potential to fit guns where crew members couldn't physically fit. Indeed, the 177 would not be a slacker in the armament department. It would be an exceptionally well-defended aircraft, sporting no less than three 20mm MG151s in the frontal gondola, dorsal, and tail turret, three 13mm MG131s in a dorsal turret and gondola, as well as a forward-firing 7.92mm MG81 machine gun. The aircraft's enormous bomb bay could also carry up to 7,000 kilograms or 15,000 pounds of bombs, a 
as well as underwing racks, which, among other things, could mount three Fritz X guided anti shipping bombs, each one containing 320 kilograms or 700 pounds of explosives. And by the summer of 1939, as war with England and France was looking increasingly likely, the Luftwaffe expressed further interest in a long range bomber for upcoming conflicts with these two superpowers. In July, an order for 20 pre production Heinkel HG 177's A0s was drafted which would later be increased to 30, just in time for the aircraft's maiden flight in November of that year. In a flight lasting 12 minutes, the aircraft's performance was considered overall favourable, nothing short of a miracle after everything the design team had been put through, although the flight had to be abandoned after just 12 minutes due to a sharp rise in engine temperatures. This would be a recurring pattern with the HG-177. The initial dream of evaporative cooling had been just that, a dream, as the heat output of the DB606s was truly extraordinary and far more than the optimistic evaporative cooling system could deal with. Indeed, even with the enormous annular radiators supplemented by two further wing radiators outboard of the nacelles, the heat could barely be kept at bay, and high engine temperatures would be a hallmark of the 177 throughout its entire service life. Continuing flight testing, this pre-production prototype was 20.6 meters in length and 31.4 in span, weighing in at 13,700 kilograms empty and just over 23,000 fully loaded. The weight, impressively low all things considered, would rise by an astonishing 10 tons by the time it ended service. By 1940, four further prototypes had been constructed and were undergoing testing and were subject to continuous minor improvements, a process that continued until early 1941, when another hallmark weakness of the design showed itself. During a simulation of a low-level attack run, both engines simultaneously caught fire, causing the aircraft to crash, a complete write-off. The fire, naturally linked to the temperature issues of the DB606s, would certainly not be a first, and in fact, the aircraft would go on to become infamous for this very shortcoming, being nicknamed Reich's Lighter after its proclivity to catch fire. Nevertheless, a production line was set up, and by 1942, HE-177A1s began rolling out of their factories to operational units. However, of the 130 A1s produced between January 1942 and January 1943, the vast majority were very quickly withdrawn from service. The aircraft was simply not ready, and engine issues continued to be a serious Achilles heel of the project. The exact reason why the DB606s was so unreliable is a multifaceted issue. The engines had been trialed before with reasonable reliability, but the tight-fitting cowl on the 177, originally a weight-saving measure, had birthed a whole host of other issues. One issue was the fact that the exhaust from the 24 cylinders generated immense heat, and due to the side-by-side -side coupling of the engines, the central cylinder banks had to share one exhaust port on the underside of the nozzle to exhaust drum. This port would often become excessively hot and heat the usual accumulation of oil and grease on the bottom of the nacelle to catch fire. Further, the lack of a firewall, another weight-saving measure, meant that there was virtually no separation between the engines and the wing's main spar, from which came the oil and fluid lines. So they were packed extremely close to the engine's exterior and would frequently saturate it with hot oil and fuel. Not content with just these issues, a badly designed oil pump meant that at higher altitudes the oil would often foam, vastly reducing its lubricating qualities. This would often lead to disintegration of the connecting rod bearings, which could result in the con rods bursting through either one of the component engine crankcases and puncturing the oil tanks. The oil would then spill out onto the central exhaust port, which was usually extremely hot. All this to say, the coupling of two engines in a single nacelle had been a novel idea, but the execution had left it being far less desirable than a normal four-engine layout or even just a standard twin-engine bomber. 
in absolutely ideal circumstances, the HE177 could outperform either one of those classes, but the crux of the issue is that it could virtually never operate in its ideal circumstances, due to its cataclysmically bad reliability. Amongst other things, the initial A1 type, which had entered and then quickly been removed from service, had demonstrated poor lateral stability in normal flight, meaning that the bomb accuracy from the aircraft was exceedingly inaccurate. Work to remedy this resulted in the A3, with a lengthened fuselage, of which over 300 were built entering service in 1943. The operational history of the aircraft had been, thus far, very little to write home about. Earlier variants had seen use as an emergency measure to supply the encircled 6th Army at Stalingrad, but it carried comparable cargo to the much smaller and much more reliable HE-111. Indeed, although it had been delivered to units in reasonable numbers, it originally simply wasn't flown operationally because it was considered unfit for combat duty. An attempt to use it as a light bomber and flak suppressor around Stalingrad had resulted in 7 of the 13 available aircraft being lost. None to enemy action, all to engine fires. Although the large amounts of HE-177s being produced suggested that they would be being used in some capacity, in reality, the vast majority were sat around airfields around Europe, awaiting engine modifications or sufficient fuel to fly them. Operation Steinbock, a reinvigorated strategic bombing offensive against South England in early 1944, represented another chance for the now fairly mature 177 to come into its own. But of the 14 aircraft ready for the mission, 8 returned with overheating engines. One suffered a burst tire on takeoff, one was shot down en route, and only 4 made it to England. The aircraft was not a total failure though, in the rare instance that the crews who flew it were able to make effective use of it. A technique was developed that involved climbing to an altitude of 7,000 meters, or 22,000 feet, over German territory, and then throttling back and going into a shallow dive towards England, arriving over the target at around 4,500 meters, 15,000 feet. At this point, the crew would release their bomb load, open up the engines, which would hopefully be fairly cool after running at lower settings and at such high altitude, and then continue their powered shallow dive back towards Germany. With this technique, the crews could maintain a speed of around 650 km an hour, 400 miles an hour, back towards France. The average loss rate for German bombers during Operation Steinbock was 60%. In stark contrast, the HE-177 suffered only a 10% loss rate, making it by far the most survivable bomber of the campaign. However, this would really be the last significant operational use of the aircraft, as huge fuel shortages grounded the HE-177, as well as most other bomber types, in favour of fighter production and upkeep, a desperate measure to counter the Allied bombing raids. With over a thousand airframes built, and sporting an extremely unglamorous combat career, the HE-177 went down in history as an aircraft more dangerous to itself than to the enemy. However, despite its shortcomings, it was undoubtedly a technologically interesting aircraft. It was the first to adopt numerous innovations which became more common on bomber aircraft later in the war. The Heinkel engineers had done all they could to come to terms with the requirements of the RLM, but in the end, it just wasn't good enough. Sadly, no 177s survive today, despite numerous examples falling into the hands of both the British and the French. A huge thanks to my patrons on screen now for supporting the channel, and thank you so much for watching this video of Aviation Deep Dive. Consider liking and subscribing for more weekly content, and please also consider supporting us on Patreon. See you in the skies.